Um, is this uh, yep. picking up on your mic okay? All right. Um, welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, if you have not already signed in, there is a sign-in sheet on the table. We'd appreciate if everybody could sign in. Um, and I see that uh, all three uh, hard copies of the report that, that we had are uh, taken. Uh, the report is available currently on the uh, Surface Water Quality Bureau web page, on the front page of that, because it's a new thing. If you do want an additional hard copy, uh, let us know, give us a mailing address, and we can also send one. Um, the agenda of the meeting is I uh, will do introductions. We'll have a general overview of monitoring and assessment, which is uh, how we get our data and what we do with it. And we'll do an overview of the total maximum daily load or TMDL process. Then we'll look at the specific uh, proposed TMDLs that are in this package, in this report, and we will have time for discussions, question and answers. Um, so I'm Rachel Jankowitz. I'm a TMDL writer, although in this case, being such a large report, it was somewhat of a group effort. Um, and uh, um, over here is uh, Heidi Henderson. She's our TMDL coordinator. Sarah Holcomb with the Point Source uh, Permitting Program. And our uh, bureau chief, Shelley Lemon, is also along today over the front of the room. And um, I think, you know, what we'd like to do, uh, since we, we don't have too huge of a group, could we go around the room and have uh, each person just say their, their name and who you're representing or what your interest is? Um, start anywhere. Calvin Henson, Wayford Plant, Two Gary. Mark Martinez, Assistant City Manager, City Two Gary. Ron Chavez, City Commissioner. Don Jockmore, City Commissioner. Cameron Twain, Char Hydro Corporation. Jason Phillips, Public Works Director, City of Raton. I'm Al Litchfield, uh, Raton Water Board. Joe Galari, Raton Water Board. Scott Berry, Raton City Manager. Dan Campbell, Raton Water Utility Manager. Marty Mayfield, KRTN. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you guys from Tooth and Carry for coming all the way up here. Appreciate that. Oh, Buster. <laughs> Albert Chavez, I'm the, I'm the Office of the State Engineer in Cimarron. So we'll get on to the monitoring and assessment portion. Um, everything that we do is under the authority of the Federal Clean Water Act. Um, the purpose of the Clean Water Act is to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters in order to reach a level of water quality that provides for the protection and propagation of fish, shellfish, and wildlife and provides for recreation in and on the water. And specifically, it is Section 303D of that act that requires the states to develop uh, these TMDL documents. Um, and uh, the way that we go about that is that we develop water quality standards. We monitor and assess uh, water bodies in the state. Uh, the waters that are impaired, according to the standards, are placed on an impaired list called the 303D list. Uh, for those waters, we develop the total maximum daily load. And uh, for uh, cases where the impairment is due to point source inputs, we will issue or revise point source permits. Uh, where we are dealing with uh, non-point source watershed inputs, uh, we work with watershed groups to uh, implement best management practices. Uh, the purposes of the water quality standards are to protect the public health or welfare enhance the quality of water, and again, to serve the purposes of the Clean Water Act. Um, we monitor uh, surface water bodies for a variety of different components, physical, chemical, and biological. And uh, when that data comes in, we have a document called the Comprehensive Assessment and Listing Methodology that is publicly available also on our website and that will detail 
how we determine whether the designated uses and the water quality standards are or are not being met for that particular water body. It is uh, the methods are reviewed and revised as needed every other year. And uh, we do assess uh, all uh, data that's submitted also from outside sources uh, that meets our quality standards. So if you do have any data uh, which you would care to submit, which you think might meet the quality standards, um, you can go to the website and we'll uh, put you in touch with the right persons to, to discuss that with and submit it to you. Um, the Clean Water Act reporting, uh, when a water body does meet the state water quality standards, it is listed on the uh, 303D, 305B list as fully supporting, or if it was previously listed as impaired, it would be delisted. When a water body does not meet the water quality standards, the impairment is added or continued on the list. Uh, we may collect additional data to confirm as needed and we would prioritize that water body for ATMDL development. And uh, there are also cases where uh, water bodies don't meet the water quality standards and uh, w it is our judgment that the uh, water quality standard needs to be revised, that it's not correct for that water body. And we have, uh, you know, there is a formal process as well for doing that. Um, so the total maximum daily load process, or the way we uh, go about calculating these, um, the document, this big report, it has several TMDLs. So each TMDL is specific to a water body, one water body, and one pollutant. The document collects all those together. Um, it is a, a, establishes specific goals in order to try to meet the water quality standards. It includes uh, target loading capacities for the various pollutants, which I'll, I'll get to a little bit more about that in a minute. And it also generates information leading to potential uh, either permit revisions and implementation or the development of watershed-based plans. So that uh, target loading capacity, it's the, the the uh, actual daily load that we're looking for is what it is is the maximum amount of a particular pollutant that can enter a water body without causing an exceedance of the water quality standard. And it's calculated by taking the uh, standard itself for that particular water body and that particular pollutant, and we multiply apply that by a critical flow, which is usually we use a low flow. Uh, sometimes there's reasons for using other flows. Um, and then the conversion factor is just to make the uh, units come out correct. Um, the TMDL, once we have that quantity, is allocated to three different um, pools. The margin, the MOS margin of safety is to account for a you know, whatever uncertain, uncertainty there is in, in terminating the data or in the methods that we use to do the calculation. Uh, the LA or load allocation is pollution from uh, non-point sources. And the WLA or waste load allocation is from uh, known point sources, which would be uh, permitted. Um, the process for getting this from a draft TMDL report, which it is now, to a final TMDL, is um, that it is reviewed uh, by our internal staff and by the EPA Region 6 in Dallas uh, prior to releasing the public comment draft. So we've already done that part. Um, it is released then for a 30-day public comment period, which is uh, currently ongoing. Stakeholders are notified of the draft TMDL and the public meeting uh, via our email list. Uh, SWQB hosts a public meeting, which is where we are at right now. And uh, stakeholders can submit then written comments that, um, and back here on the table back here, we have um, both public comment input forms, which you can use to submit comments, and also probable source forms, which is for comments that are specific to potential sources of pollutants. Um, you can also email us. So there are various ways to get in touch with us. Um, any comments that we received during the public comment period in writing 
are actually added to the report as an appendix, and we do uh, provide written responses to those comments. Um, what we have then, once we've incorporated comment, is a final draft, and we bring this to the New Mexico Water Quality Control Commission. At this particular one, we're hoping to bring in August. It's uh, their August 13th meeting. Um, if uh, they hopefully approve the TMDLs, it is then incorporated into the New Mexico Water Quality Management Plan and submitted to EPA Region 6 for final approval. And um, once it's been EPA approved, it is posted um, more or less permanently on our web page for TMDLs on, the, on our website. So um, getting more now to the specific uh, water bodies and impairments that these TMDLs address. It does say Canadian River up there. You'll probably notice that there are a few on the dry Cimarron as well. Um, and uh, we, survey, we surveyed the entire Canadian River watershed and the dry Cimarron uh, for two years in 2015 to 2016. They're, you know, ge geographically close together, and it made sense for um, just logistically to do those all together. Um, and I, I'm going to um, take the time to read uh, these next two slides that um, talk about the particular water bodies because it's a large report. There's a lot here. And this is what we're talking about, though. The Conscious River from... Conscious Reservoir to Solitary Creek is impaired, new impairment for aluminum and E. coli. Doggett Creek, Raton Creek to Headwaters has an E. coli impairment or an E. coli TMDL in the document. Uh, the East Fork, Chickarico Creek, from Chickarico Creek to Headwaters, uh, E. coli TMDL. Tinaha Creek, uh, West Fork to Headwaters is an E. coli TMDL. And the Mora River uh, from the USGS gauge east of Shoemaker to Highway 434 is an E. coli TMDL. Um, the Conscious River, again, ab above the reservoir, is also impaired for plant nutrients. Uh, Coyote Creek from uh, Mora River to the headwaters basically is impaired for plant nutrients and temperature. The Dry Cimarron from Oklahoma to the headwaters is impaired for plant nutrients and temperature. Raton Creek from Chickarica Creek to Headwaters is for uh, plant nutrients. Long Canyon uh, perennial reaches above the, the dry Cimarron has a TMDL for temperature. The Canadian from uh, between the two reservoirs is a temperature TMDL. And uh, Pajarito Creek, uh, the perennial portions from the Canadian River to the Hill Canyon are, has a, a temperature TMDL here. So those are the specific water bodies we're looking at. And uh, in map form. That's the, uh, the Mora watershed. And uh, that would be the uh, reservoir and conscious watersheds. So the uh, aluminum pyramid, and this is just for that one assessment unit, um, aluminum is an abundant element in the Earth's crust. Concentrations in surface water will vary according to local geology and according to human activities. Uh, elevated aluminum concentrations may cause, uh, they, they bind to the, func the gills and impair the gill function, which can lead to increased mortality and retard growth in egg production. Uh, chronic high levels are also toxic to benthic invertebrates and uh, some single-celled algae. And uh, we have a aquatic life criterion for a total recoverable aluminum, which is uh, basically dissolved aluminum plus uh, the very smallest bits of the, the uh, particulate aluminum, and it's hardness dependent because uh, the availability to biological organisms depends on the hardness of the water. And um, again, we just have the one TMDL in this group for um, aluminum. It is the Conscious River um, above the reservoir. and um, the probable sources, and I, I'll just um, 
point out where it says background geology there. The ultimate source of the aluminum is from the rocks of the Earth crust and the, the uh, soil derived from them. Uh, however, these uh, other man-made causes can lead to um, excess amounts of that um, going into the water. And, um, e. coli, we have several uh, TMDLs for that in this bundle. So um, total coliform bacteria are a group of bacteria that are fairly common in the environment and they're grouped together because they're, they function similarly uh, biochemically. Um, fecal coliform bacteria are a subset of the total coliforms which live in the intestines of uh, warm-blooded animals. So humans, livestock, wildlife, birds, not fish because they're not warm-blooded. Um, and the species Escherichia coli or E. coli is used um, it's something that we've developed um, testing methods for, and it is an indicator of the presence of fecal coliform bacteria in the water. Um, and the reason that that's a concern, aside from being kind of gross, it, it indicates that the water has been contaminated with fecal material. Most E. coli themselves are not harmful, although there's a few strains that can cause disease. But if you have fecal coliform in the water, that water may also be contaminated by other disease-producing bacteria or viruses or protozoans, uh, which would also be present in the fecal material. Um, some waterborne pathogenic diseases are typhoid fever, viral or bacterial gastroenteritis or hepatitis A. And uh, this is kind of a conglomeration of probable sources from all the uh, E. coli TMDL uh, water bodies in this report. And at this point, um, Heidi Henderson is going to take over the presentation. All right. Rachel hand handled the first part, and I am going to take the second half. So, um, talk about plant nutrients. Um, what are plant nutrients and why are they a concern? Um, why do we have TMDLs for those? So the TMDLs in this document um, were written with endpoints of both total nitrogen and total phosphorus. Our assessment protocol um, also incorporates dissolved oxygen in our analysis, um, but the TMDL just addresses total nitrogen and total phosphorus. Um, aquatic communities can be affected by low dissolved oxygen, light limitation, um, changes in species composition, and mobility obstruction. Um, excess nutrients can also cause excess algae that can cause nuisance odors and can be unsightly. Um, high concentrations of nutrients can also lead to algae blooms, which themselves can produce toxins. So for all these reasons, um, that's why we have a nutrient standard, that's why we collect nutrient samples, and that's why we've written a nutrient TMDL. Um, so here is a list of probable sources. Again, it's a combined list of all of the impaired assessment units in the document. Um, <coughs> again, as Rachel mentioned, we have a uh, probable source um, comment card in the back here on the table. So this is one of the points at a public meeting where we definitely um, welcome your input about what could be additional probable sources. Um, for these nutrient impairments in these um, impaired water bodies. So the last set of TMDLs in this document um, are the temperature TMDLs, and as you noticed in an earlier slide, we had quite a few of these um, temperature impaired water bodies in the watershed. Um, as I think we all know, water temperature can vary both seasonally and throughout the day. Um, but Temperature affects aquatic life by influencing the amount of oxygen that is available in the water for the aquatic life. Um, the rate of, photo of photosynthesis of algae and other aquatic plants is affected um, by increases in temperature, and um, the rates of growth and reproduction can be affected um, by increases in temperature, as well as organisms' sensitivity to wastes and parasites and diseases. Um, if they're stressed, they're more um, sensitive to um, other effects in the water. This graph down here at the bottom of the slide is um, pulled from the 
TMDL and as an example of um, some of the data that we would collect over the course of um, weeks, but this is just a smaller snapshot of that. So the, our water quality standard um, for temperature is in degrees Celsius, um, but our TMDL is written in kilojoules per day. Uh, the, TM, the document explains that conversion. Um, and so we also, for temperature TMDLs, also use the SS temp computer model um, to basically model what the current conditions are, um, the impaired current conditions, and what the conditions would look like when it's meeting the water quality standard. What does that difference look like and what could maybe be done in the watershed to return the water body to the water quality standard? So um, often what we focus on is increased shade, how much increased shade might need to happen in order to bring it to the water quality standard or um, how much uh, width to depth ratio of the stream might need to be adjusted um, with projects in order to help the stream be closer to the water quality standard. Here's this table again. Uh, this is again a, a combined list of all the um, temperature probable sources of all of the impaired assessment units. Um, and again, we welcome a comment on these sources also. Um, so we went through all four groups of TMDLs that are in this document. Uh, so then what happens next? Um, as you remember from one of those earlier charts, TMDL implementation happens after the TMDL document is approved. And it can happen in both the point source and the non-point source um, areas of our programs. So once a TMDL is approved, it is incorporated um, as necessary into our MPDS permits in the watershed. And then it's, the TMDL then is also incorporated into watershed protection programs through our 319 grant programs. So what kind of restoration can happen after a TMDL is approved by the Water Quality Control Commission and EPA? Um, again, as I mentioned, it would be incorporated into permits and the permittee would then be required to meet those loading requirements outlined in the TMDL that's incorporated into their permit. Um, there's also the opportunity to work with watershed groups and develop a watershed-based plan. So a watershed-based plan outlines steps that can be taken in order to improve the water quality in the stream. It focuses on non-point sources in the watershed and it's an opportunity for stakeholders and community groups to be involved in the process. Um, it's also uh, important to implement on the ground projects to restore water quality as part of this process. Um, developing a watershed-based plan is just the first part, but then actually implementing that project and doing the project on the ground is the next step. So the current, the TMDL we've been discussing this evening is currently out for public comment. The 30-day comment period closes on July 5th. Uh, there's the website that Rachel mentioned that it's available on the main uh, Surface Water Quality Bureau website. Written comments can be provided to Rachel tonight or they can be submitted um, via any of those formats. So what are the next steps in the process? Um, any written comments we receive uh, before the end of July 5th, before 5 p.m. and July 5th, will be incorporated into the TMDL document as an appendices. We will also respond to those comments and that uh, document with the response to comments will be presented to the New Mexico Water Quality Control Commission. We plan to present at their August 13th meeting. And once we receive final approval from well, prior to the, 10 days prior to the meeting, that draft will be available on the website. And we will also contact all commenters who reached out to us and, and provided comment. We will make sure to provide them with the final draft uh, prior to the WQCC meeting in August. So if you provide comments either tonight or in writing later, we will make sure to provide you the responses to your comments uh, before the commission meeting. And actually, let me go back. There's, I, there wasn't a bullet, but I'll just say that after the commission meeting, then that's, and once the commission approves it, then we submit it to EPA for their approval and they're required to make a decision within 30 days. So um, that is what we expect the process to follow uh, going forward. So now to this slide. <laughs> <laughs> so now, uh, does anybody have any questions uh, for us about the TMDL? 
So everything in there is uh, perennial, and you haven't looked at any intermittent, intermittent uh, streams or ephemeral. Those, everything is perennial here. Uh, there are some in intermittent streams. Doggett Creek, okay. for example, is um, considered uh, listed as uh, intermittent in the um, okay. in our list. So yes, there are. Uh, We've assessed, uh, we collected data on intermittent streams and then we compared those data to the water quality standards and um, listed it as impaired if that was appropriate. And, and you had that formula where you said, well, it's a non point source plus point source. Uh, yes. Do you yep. kind of go through that in the TMDL, kind of break? those down or yes yes those? right so for each of there in in the tmdl there's a section for each of the parameters so there's an aluminum section an e coli section um not all of the sections not all the parameters had uh, a point source in the water in the watershed okay. um i think aluminum is an example of that there was no point source so all of the um the t all of the TMDL except for the margin of safety was assigned to non-point sources because there was no, uh, there were no discharges in that watershed. But in watersheds where there is a point source and non-point sources, then it's um, divided between the two, and it's discussed how that uh, allocation happens. And there's also a TMDL implementation section in the back that specifically talks about each of the permittees and each of the impairments and how um, the implementation is expected to go forward. Out of a sampling cycle, what determines when it's impaired? If it's detected on any of your samples, or is there a percentage, or what drives when it's considered impaired? If it's ever detected on any of them? Or? Uh, that's a good question. So um, that whole process is outlined in our document called the CALM, the Comprehensive Assessment Listing Methodology, which i um, glad you brought that up, Dan, because um, our, our next revised one is going to be out for public comment in the next couple weeks. Um, so look for that if you are interested in reviewing the next one we're proposing. But um, to answer your question, it, it varies on parameter, but um, no, not just one sample is enough to list it as impaired. Um, it has to be more than two. And then it's a percentage depending on how many samples we've collected. Because I see on E. coli at a dog, it's two out of two. <laughs> what is, is that because it's two that it crosses the limit to where if it had been one out of 20. It, it would not. Yeah. Okay. I think it's 10% when you have more than When you have more than 10, 10 samples, samples, it's 10%. It's 10% exceedance rate. So you, you just got in the... So <laughs> two divided by 20 is 10. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You lucked out there. <laughs> I don't think that's lucked out, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be positive. I'm trying to be positive. <laughs> Who decides the amount of samples that they take? Um, so, so we... So if it took 21, we'd have been all right? If it didn't exceed... <laughs> it could have exceeded that third one. If it exceeded, one. then we still would have been in the same position. So um, we have <laughs> two-year water quality surveys. Um, so at the beginning of our water quality survey, so for example, for the Canadian Dry Cimarron, that was in 2015 and 16. So early in 2015, we hosted public meetings to present our sampling plan. And that's where that's outlined um, in our, what's called a FSP, our field sampling plan, is outlined how many times we plan to, present, uh, to, plan to collect at each site. Uh, we have primary and secondary sites. So primary sites, um, we try to collect eight samples over the course of two years. And secondary sites, it's usually four and then ladies have their own um, sampling regime. But it's spelled out in our FSP, so that is where um, we spell that out. So it, it's, I mean, primarily based on financial resources and staff resources, we'd love to collect more data. Um, I guess we really like Doggett Creek, so we collected 20 samples there, but, <laughs> um, you know, over the, so it, it's basically, you know, comes down to staff and financial resources is why we um, really can only collect as many as eight over the course of two years. But it, so it assumes it's, like I said, at this one it, it actually affects because the plant does discharge over there. But, Mr. City Manager, that's also the drainage out of town. It, it doesn't differentiate that it might be his problem and not mine. Right. If you look in the uh, appendix where we uh, lay out the, the actual data numbers, we do have samples from both above. Right. and below the plant as well as the plant samples 
That does not provide a clear picture. The numbers don't make total sense to me, but, but we tried and we report them, if you can make sense out of it. Um, and we're assuming above, or if there's not a point source discharge, could be everything from septic to livestock to animal, whatever. It could be like. any of those uh, probable sources, yeah. Yeah, that's where the probable source sheet comes right. into play, is just, we're not trying to quantify Right. what each source is we're just trying to identify it so when the tmdl gets implemented and we start looking at planning and right. um on the ground projects where should we focus our efforts and try to um, prioritize those sources um, to help improve water quality and a number of communities in the state have applied for um, grant funding to do BST studies, bacteria, bacteria source tracking studies that, you know, can differentiate uh, genetically between human bacteria and elk or dog or bird um, E. coli. Okay, from Tootin Carey, our discharges are diverted by a farm in Rancho. It never makes its body to creek. And every time it was sampled, there was no discharge. Right. How's that going to affect us? Um, so you have, uh, Potterito Creek has a E. coli TMDL um, because Potterito Creek was found to be impaired for E. coli. Right. Um, the E. coli uh, limit that was dis it, that's discussed in the TMDL is no different than what's already currently in your MPDS yeah. permit. Same so for practical purposes, there's not going to be any difference from uh, what you'll see in your permit because your permit is written to the water quality standard and we wrote the TMDL to the water quality standard. So, um, I mean, there's, there are more contributors to Palmerito Creek than potentially the treatment plant, but, uh, so we had more to consider. Um, but for practical purposes for your plant, for E. coli, there won't be any uh, change to your permit. Okay, and then the temperature won't affect us either. Correct, you were, um, uh, the TMDL discusses that it was determined that uh, the, there's there's no waste of, there's no waste load allocation or no um, limit assigned for temperature for the plant um, because the plant is not a temperature contributor it doesn't have the uh, potential to contribute high temperature to the stream so um, it's all discussed in the TMDL and that's definitely something that EPA looks at when we when we assign a facility a big zero they want to know why we are not um, including the uh, facility so we have a discussion in there. Um, about why uh, we don't feel any treatment plan really is a contributor to uh, increases in temperature. What's the limit for temperature? It varies uh, in this, over this big Canadian watershed. Um, I guess I would have to, do you have that part of the theme? Do you I mean, in, in a yeah. high quality mountain stream, it's gonna be 20, 20 degrees Celsius. Right. Um, it'll either be 23 or 24 max, maximum. Yeah. Like that would be, if it exceeds that more than once, that maximum temperature. Um, the 20 is kind of like over a certain period of time, over a certain number of days. Um, and then it can go all the way up to 32.2 in warm water systems, like down by the Texas border. I don't know if that's a warm water, probably, but I would imagine it's a warm water aquatic mm -hmm. life, and that would be 32.2 degrees Celsius. Right. So we do have in this watershed. I just have a copy of the TMDL. Uh, the water quality standards for the impaired reaches in this document vary from uh, 23 degrees up to 32.2. Yeah, got yeah. it right. Good. Yes. <laughs> So it depends on, you know, it, it's, it's not uh, one standard for the whole state, it's uh, watershed specific. Are there any more questions? If you don't have any tonight, we're definitely available um, email or phone call or anything like that. If you think of something else, we're welcome to I've answer it. Just questions. a general question. In the case of Doggett Creek, that's effluent dependent to be a stream in the first place, isn't it kind of against most trains of thought to say zero discharge, like Tucum Perry would be doing, is better for that creek than slightly impaired water? I mean, an adverse effect on aquatic life, no water versus slightly impaired water, and you would think that having some water of that slightly impaired would 
be better for my existence than no water at all. No, I understand. <laughs> Shelly, do you want to tackle that? <laughs> we, you're passing the buck. I am passing the buck. This is a very common question, you know, that we get. Is it is it better for the facility to completely pull out of the stream and it dry? Right. No so, discharge. I mean, right, right. right. It's and a very common question. We get it. You know, is it better for the stream, for the treatment plant to just pull out of the stream altogether and just then it's dry? So, which is... It may be better for your permit because then you don't have... <laughs> Um, requirements for that discharge yes if you're removing it the aquatic environment goes away for for the state of New Mexico we have standards whether it's ephemeral intermittent or perennial so we protect all water bodies even if there's only water in there for two days a year um, we do have limited aquatic life standards that it has to meet um, it has to meet acute standards so anything that if an aquatic organism is in there, it would die, you know, like, it's not chronic exposure because there's not a whole lot of time for it to be exposed, but we do have water quality standards for those different types of systems. Um, and I think that pulling out of the stream is dependent on the community. I mean, for a carry, that's what they've been trying to do, I know that there have been some complications recently, um, but again, you know, they discharge to Breen's Pond, and then there's some discharge like below Breen's, but it doesn't really make it to Pajarito, but that's what your <coughs> permit defines as your discharge location. So it, I mean, it's all dependent on what the community decides is best for them, what makes sense for them. Um, you know, with Doggett Creek, if we can make the permit work and you can keep it in the stream and also reuse the water part of the year and kind of go back and forth, it may help the stream recover, you know, so you're not getting 100% of the nutrients or the E. coli in the stream at once. It's kind of variable um, and it gives the stream a break. Maybe that would help. Um, with stream recovery um, so yeah we agree if you pull out of the river you may lose the river but it would be ephemeral and it would still be protected theoretically so I don't know if I quite answered your question but we do agree but, I mean <laughs> from a common sense standpoint it yeah. just seems like if it's effluent dependent and that's gone even if emerald in a rainstorm, essentially the aquatic life would cease to exist in most of the places if we pull out. There, and because this is an arid state, there's a lot of facilities like that. There are, I wouldn't necessarily call them aquatic, but there are insects and other um, like amphibians that use those rainstorms and those storm events to, two days, man, they go for it, they're in, their life cycle's over, they bury it back down in the sand or they're dead but they use it um, and so that's what we try to account for it might not be a fishery but it might be some other type of organism that uses that water for those short duration periods um, you know that's why we're we're trying to work yes. on this issue we know it's a problem we're working with Santa Fe they have the same issue they're discharging it's ephemeral above their discharge perennial below so um, having that effluent dependent system, it is a little bit different. We're trying to figure out solutions to that. We don't have the answer I'm sure it's yet. it's relatively <laughs> common in New Mexico because yeah. there's not a lot of stream flow in some areas. Yeah, there's not, even when we do have stream flow, it's not a lot of dilution. I mean, the streams might be this big. Um, so it's still, the majority is effluent. So we're trying to find solutions. Um, and working with communities to find out what's best for you. I mean, maybe it is pulling out of the river. Maybe it's not. We don't know yet. <laughs> Shelly, I know we have talked about this a number of times, and you know, it's not really something we're reflecting here in our particular circumstance, but maybe you can kind of give us your perspective on uh, this seasonal thing because. Uh, you know, it's a lot harder to achieve uh, standards 
in the cold months, the plant doesn't work as well, or, or geese around, or whatever it is, but then we don't have the impacts uh, to the stream during the cold months, too. But I don't know if you can kind of give us, uh, you know, in a general way, your perspective is on this. Is the seasonal, seasonal limit something that's been thought about or could be in place some places, especially on nutrients, to where it's we, like here in the wintertime, it is ice or cold for the large part of the time. Yeah. And, you know, you can't uh, really, it's hard to achieve that zero discharge in the winter. Yeah. You can use it all in the warm months and, yeah. and cold months and stuff. We do have um, seasonal limits. Doesn't Mora? Uh, Mora, have? so Chama and Angel Fire, too, I can think of that have pretty, like, growing season and not. Um, because of the cold, uh, but then Mora has it different because of their irrigation season and they when they're drawing and when they're not. But they that's also a little bit different, but it's still a. And Rudo so previously had temperature dependent, so they had to meet certain nutrient mm -hmm. nutrient limits when the temperature was cold versus when it was warmer. Um, they don't have that anymore, but it has been looked at depending on. Um, the facility and what EPA feels is reasonable. Um, so it is a possibility. You still have to meet in-stream limits regardless of when you're discharging. It's just a matter of, you know, what that limit would be in the winter versus the summer. Those nutrients, even though you're discharging in the winter, are, especially for nutrients, are cycling biologically, so they don't disappear. Um, they're still in the river, and so we, it's just a longer period of time for the stream to assimilate that, which is helpful, instead of just dumping it in and constantly. And I know it's somewhat addressed to here, but to just say from a tone standpoint that uh, NMED and Jill and, and her staff have worked really well with us because we are trying to work for a temporary standard that would help on our discharge. And like I said, that, that process is moving forward. Hopefully. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully. We're planning to move it forward. So. Do y'all have any other questions? Well, if you have any uh, input on the probable sources, um, there's forms uh, in the back. We also have them on our website. Or if you have any written comments, tonight is great. Or, uh, you know, to get it to us before um, July 5th is also helpful and it'll be incorporated into the document. Um, so if you have any more questions, feel free to call or email us. And thank you for coming tonight and braving the, the rain and hail outside. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your time. Thank you.